Hey, when it comes to growing on the equator, we've heard it all. All of it. No bugs. No. There, great soil. Yeah, as I push the way of the bugs. There are no bugs here. You've heard the great soil one. Anything grows here. Oh, sure. Anything everywhere. And everything is organic. Oh, if only. Stay tuned as we give our experiences on growing food here in Vilcabamba, Ecuador. Well, we're so glad you joined us today, and uh, thanks for being here on the channel with us. So we want to talk to you about our experiences in gardening and growing food and growing plants here. And, you know, we're just just a little off the equator here in southern Ecuador, but we're pretty darn close. Latitude zero is up above Quito. It's uh, colder up there. Yeah, colder up there. <laughs> so we're at about 6,400 feet where we are. Vilcabamba is somewhere around 4,800, 5,000. So we're a little bit higher than the city of Vilcabamba, about 2,000 meters roughly. Um so yeah, the elevation's a big one. Um, some things just don't like this elevation. That's true. Everything that we've bought and tried to grow, we buy one and then we'll see if it grows because we don't know if it'll work at this elevation. And if it does, then we buy more. If it doesn't, then we can't. Yeah, some things just don't like it this high. And uh, some things will grow well in Bilcabamba, but not way up here. Well, and um, we're cooler. So yeah, we do we have a bit cooler, a little bit cooler, which gets us into our second point is temperature. Oh, yeah. Temperature makes a big deal. Temperature that may be perfect for us may not be perfect for the plants. Yeah, a great example of that is um, stone fruits, your peaches, plums, things like that. You know, um, they actually like a little bit of cold weather. Most most varieties like some cold, uh, cold hours, as they mm -hmm. call it. Same thing with apples. They like those cold hours. There are varieties that don't take as much cold hours, mm. but let's face it, it just never really gets below 60 degrees here. <laughs> um, on a rough day, it might be 58, but... Yeah, 58, we're complaining, but... <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, it's pretty consistently 60 at night mm. and, uh, you know, 75 during the day here at our house. Oh, we do grow apples. We Not do have, many. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're small. They're very flavorful. Mm -hmm. And most people are surprised that we have apples growing right here. Mm -hmm. But the local nurseries are growing a variety that takes a whole lot less chilling hours. Yeah. And and they're good. I don't know what they're called, but we keep buying them. We like them. I don't know. Um, originally, they were all teeny tiny and they were flavorful, but not really sweet. Um, but then the last, last year, I started putting bags on them and then they grew. And oh my gosh, a tree ripened apple really good and what she means by bags is mesh bags over the fruit mm -hmm. because if you don't guess what um going to be problems then you fight with the bugs so our next uh topic actually is soil and uh you know there's a lot of of uh comments about how great the soil is in ecuador well depending on where you live that may be true maybe at the coast maybe in the amazon um, but here where we are up in the mountains, yeah, not so much. No, we haven't, we've never lived anywhere that you move in and the soil's just great. Yeah, you know, if you live along the river around here, the river, river bed, you know, river bottom as we used to call it in Texas, mm. that's always going to be a better uh, mineral rich soil, a lot of sand in it. But up here where we are, man, it's, 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 it's bad. We yeah. have to uh, constantly amend it in our gardens, build raised beds all the usual things you'd have to do where we lived in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, soil is not that great where we are. So don't listen to people who tell you how great the soil is. Um, no, it we, may not be where you live. We really thought being up this high that um, it would all be a lot more natural than it is. But it's taken, a, it took us three or four years to get good soil here. Yeah, and, and still it's not that great. We're constantly amending with more mm -hmm. Uh, organic matter, you know, more calcium, more potassium, things like that. Um, just trying to make it better. It, it's a struggle. Then Lisa kind of mentioned this a little bit, the bugs. That's mm. the next point. No, there's no bugs. I know you're going to hear people <laughs> on other videos say, 
the great thing about this elevation is no bugs. Well, oh. um, I'm watching new recruits who come to Vilcabamba and wear shorts for the first time. Oh. And they get eaten up with a no CM, some mosquitoes. Yeah, their legs um, look pretty bad. Yeah, I know a friend of mine who lives in Aloha says, hey, we have mosquitoes over here. Aloha is much yeah. higher elevation. Yeah. So I can tell you here at roughly 6,400 feet, 2,000 meters, there are mosquitoes and there are no CMs mm -hmm. and there are plenty of bugs to go around. So yeah. don't believe the no bugs. Uh, yeah, when we moved in, there were no window screens on our house. If you want to know how many bugs you have, turn the light on at night because they will find you. They will find you a moth to a flame. And the big problem with gardening here that, that one of the worst things I think that we have in the way of bugs, mm. um, we do have uh, what they call gusanos here, which is a great big, um, what do we call them? In grub. English? Grub, yes. But great big grub worm. And uh, we do have those, so we have to you know make sure we keep those out. But the biggest thing are, they like to call them here the white butterflies. Yeah. But they're not butterflies, they're actually a caterpillar moth or a yeah. cabbage moth. And so they are here for about three months out of the year, and that's a miserable three months. Yeah, you're not going to get anything without holes in it unless you cover it up. Yeah, we use, um, we use a, a physical barrier, which is a bug screen we order on Amazon and have it shipped here. Mm -hmm. And um, so those will keep those moths off the plants. Now, the problem with that is if you have plants that require uh, pollination from pollinators, mm -hmm. you're blocking the pollinators out. Yep. So you'd have to open that screen up for a while during the morning, allow those uh, pollinators in there, and then shut it back up real quick. So, um, yeah, the caterpillar moths, I mean, you can spray them, and, uh, but when you're killing those, you're killing the other good stuff, and quite frankly, you're no longer organic. Well, and I will say we used a lot of organic things to get rid of critters in the States. Here, the bugs just kind of laugh at you. Ants especially, I mean, it is really, they, they don't care about organic yeah. deterrence. They'll just walk around it and go, I'm doing what I'm doing. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, the, everyone here says, oh, neem oil, neem oil. I have a pretty low of opinion of neem oil, especially if you're going to put it on leafy greens. It tastes terrible. Well, it and tastes terrible, but like the sun is so intense that it burns the plants a bit. If you don't put it on early, early, early in the morning where mm -hmm. it has time to dry before the sun comes up mm -hmm. or late at night, and I don't like putting anything on at night, Yeah. but um, anything on the plants at night. So, yeah, you know, when it comes to what you're going to spray, whatever that you're going to spray, organic or not, kills the good with the bad. So you just need to be aware of that. I think physical barriers work much better. And so that's my plan. So long as we're talking about organic thing, let's talk about everything's organic here. All the food's <laughs> organic. Oh yeah, the constitution says that only organic seeds are allowed in the country. Yeah. Try buying an organic seed in Ecuador. <laughs> it's not easy. Nope. I've seen a few organic seeds on the website mercadolibre.com. But if you go in all the agricultural stores here and ask for organic seeds, they just shake their head at you. Yeah. Um, very few people carry anything organic. You have to really hunt for it. We yeah. ship in organic seeds. Um, yeah. There's seed swaps that you can get organic where people yes. that are holding back seeds, but not like you can go buy them. Make friends with the indigenous people here, local people, and do some seed swaps. That's how you're going to get organic. And you'll also get seeds that are well suited for the area. Mm. But as long as we're talking about organic, don't expect to come here, go to the Mikado, buy your fruits and vegetables, and expect it all to be organic. It is not going to be. No. Even the Saturday Mikado here that is supposed to be the organic market, the organic farmer's market, there's a lot of talk about a lot of those vendors not being organic. Now, supposedly they do go around and do spot checks. Um, but we can tell you that we have driven by green bean fields while they were spraying and the toxic smell was so bad. Um, we have opened packages of green beans that we bought here. That were supposed to be organic. And they, this chemical smell was so strong we wouldn't even feed them to our animals. No. So um, we no longer buy green beans in Ecuador. We no. simply grow our own green beans. There are things you can buy, but there are certain ones you're going to have to stay away from if you're trying to stay organic. 
the pill bugs here. I mean, it's a constant battle. One of our vi videos is war on bugs. Yeah. And it's the pill bugs we have to fight. And in that video, we go through all of the um, uh, things that we do to fight the pill bugs off. Mm -hmm. And they love green beans. Yes, they do. So, yeah, organics here, um, you know, we see the workers walking down the street with the backpack sprayers. Mm -hmm. And, I'm, you know, now some people would defend and say, oh, well, they're spraying, uh, you know. Uh, uh, organic solutions. Yeah, or, you know, they're spraying, uh, what's that stuff in the big jug over there? The uh, Fertilizer? No. No, I don't know. Uh, the um, molasses. They use mm -hmm. molasses and water and they spray that. Well, yeah, they do that, but they also spray chemicals because I'm right behind them and I mm -hmm. smell it when they're spraying them. Yeah. The tomato fields here that we see, oh man, there's a restaurant that's across the street from one tomato field that I know about and they have to close their doors and windows when they're spraying because the smell and overspray is so strong. Um, so yeah, there are people who spray here a lot of chemicals right here in Bilcabamba. Yeah, and people say, oh, well, they don't have enough money to get chemicals. They give it to them for free. A lot of it is, you know, donated Subsidized. by the government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there is glyphosate here, which you know is Roundup, mm -hmm. um, and that's used here a lot. So, um, yeah, disappointment. Big disappointment for us was to find out how things really are not organic. Now, yeah. you can find truly organic farms here. Do not get me wrong. That's available. But there are few and far between. They're not yeah. every farm like people will lead you to believe. True. And it goes the same for eggs. I mean, a lot of people, <laughs> if they're colored, they think they're organic. If they're brown, they're not organic. Um, it has nothing to do with the color of the <laughs> it has egg. has nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's it just when, you, when you're trying to find out about organic, sometimes um, it's a little bit difficult to get straight answers from people. Yes, yeah, they want to avoid that question at all costs. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, yeah, it's organic. You know, everything's organic. It um, grows organically, but <laughs> what did you put on it? Yeah, what's been sprayed? And that's that's the question you got to ask. A spray, you know. Uh, and you want to ask them what kind of spray has been sprayed on. What, and if you go to somebody who's selling eggs and ask to go to their farm and they don't readily let you come, there's a reason. Um, they're going to have some animal feed there that's not organic. And, yeah. uh yeah, they may not do anything to them, but it does come down to what they feed them. Yeah, it really does. So, yeah, um, organics, um, they're hard to find. There are some organic products here, mm -hmm. and uh, we use a couple of things here that we like, but but there's not much. We have to mostly make whatever that you're going you're gonna to use. Yeah. So that leads me to the next point, organic supplies. Yeah. Don't think you're going to go to the hardware store here and load up on your local organic stuff. Is not going to happen. No. Um, in Aloha, I can find a few organic things. And I've mentioned before a little place downtown called Agro Aloha. Um, and they do have some stuff there. And they're very, very good about it. Um, they have mm -hmm. some organic fertilizer there that's actually OMRI certified. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that's, that's good stuff. But don't expect organic soil mixes and things to be readily available. You can go to Kiwi. You'll find some bag soils. Um, you know, some bad compost. My results with that have been less than stellar. Um, they have a lot of weed seed in them. So the compost that you're going to buy here at the local nurseries is going to be goat manure mixed with rice hulls most of the time. That's what it is. Well, that's where we started until yeah. the weeds overtook us. You will bring in more weeds that you don't currently have by using that compost because yep. goats eat everything weedy and mm -hmm. through their digestive process, the seeds are unaffected. They come out <laughs> the other end ready to sprout. <laughs> yeah. So whatever they've been eating, they're going to sprout in your garden. Mm -hmm. Unless you just bring that stuff home and uh, compost it with other materials and really get that temperature up on your compost. Yeah. They don't really compost it. They just mix it with some rice holes and, and bag it up and sell it to you for five bucks a sack. Yeah, yeah. So you got to be very careful about where you're buying compost and, and and exactly what goes into it. A lot of misunderstandings, I think, around the word organic here. I think so. I, I think that that is some people know the people that the um, Ecuadorians that know organic are 100 percent on board with organic. And they 
create their own mixes to put on stuff, which is made from onions and peppers and all different types of things. But everybody else, they, they just don't know. So I think, you know, in Texas, at the farmer's market where we sold, yeah, there were cheaters, definitely. People who were organic certified who were cheating, yeah. brain roundup, things like that. Um, and you can find uh, dozens of YouTube videos about cheaters at organic markets in the United States. Happens a lot. Yeah. Um, but just expect that it's, it's no different here, really. No. Um, if you have some organic farming neighbors, great. Hope you do. If you don't, you're going to have problems. So the next thing we want to talk about is sunlight. Sunlight is big. And I this, should say, or, or lack thereof. Yeah, I mean, today it's not raining, but it's pretty overcast. So pretty overcast. We don't really have direct sun today. In Texas, it was nothing to have, you know, 16 hours sunlight a day, sometimes 18 hours. Um, here, you have, you know, 10 hours at best, well, if you get that. Here is 12 hours of dark, 12 hours of light at best. That's on a really good day. Yeah, so. there's no daylight savings time here. No. Or the birds. Listen to the birds today. I know. Happy birds. They're up to something. So, um, yeah, sunlight's a problem here. And particularly in the last two years, we've had less sunlight than we had when we first moved here. Um, I used to have to worry working outdoors here a lot about using sunscreen. And um, I haven't worried about that in the last two years at all. No. So, yeah, sunlight's a real issue here. Everything takes a lot longer to grow here than it did in Texas. I think that, for me, was one of the most surprising things is everything, animals, everything takes longer to grow. I'm putting up some pictures here as we talk about, you know, some of the different things we've grown in. You'll see some stellar, you know, examples of great big cabbage and things like that. Well, yeah, that's because we worked real hard at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I won't say any harder than we did in Texas, but probably pretty close to the same. I will say that things like our my potatoes here are taking six months minimum to grow potatoes. Mm -hmm. um, it's taken me six months to grow most things. Now, yeah. our fast growing crops like green beans, lettuce, a couple of months, you yeah. know, lettuce, a couple of months. In yeah. Texas, I would have lettuce ready to go to market in 28 days. Um, not not here. here. No, no way. Yeah. 28 so, days, you're just getting to where you might start picking some leaves off, if that. Yeah, that's right. So while we really don't have much in the way of seasons where we're at, and I'm talking again specifically about the Bill Cabamba area, we do have what's called the dry and windy season, same season. Mm -hmm. It gets super windy and it gets really dry. So that's a real tough time to grow. You see, everybody starts getting excited again in September when the winds start dying down and we start to get a little rain. We didn't get any rains till late October this year. Mm, yeah. So, you know, people are usually planting corn around here in October. Um, so, yeah, that's a challenge. And you need to have access to irrigation Mm -hmm. um, because you're not supposed to use the potable water to irrigate. Mm -hmm. Not a good idea anyway. Uh, so yeah, you need the access to irrigation. You've got to irrigate these plants a lot. If You can grow almost all year long, except for that dry, windy season gets challenging. Yeah, I would say we, we're not limited as much by the seasons for growing. Um, plants do have a life cycle. I mean, the green beans definitely have a life cycle. Um, uh, some things just keep growing, but most of it, you if you don't really irrigate during the dry season, you'll lose it in the dry season. Yeah, and I think, you know, when you, you're putting baby transplants out during the dry season, that wind comes along and just butchers them. So timing's everything. <laughs> well, we had green beans because we usually just keep green beans growing. And we had green beans growing throughout the dry season, but... It was so windy, even though we got green beans off of it, they had been dried out so bad from the from the wind that uh, they they weren't any good to eat. They were you know, dry and stringy. So we do have a bonus tip for you today, and that tip is stick to what grows well in your area. 
look around, see what your neighbors are growing, see what Ecuadorians typically grow. You know, right here on our property, avocados seem to do pretty well. Yep. Mangoes do okay. You do have to net bag the fruit mm -hmm. or the bugs will get them. Citrus grows everywhere. Yeah, citrus does grow everywhere here. Bananas grow pretty good up at this elevation. They do. I'm going to say if you like bananas, we have a lot of banana plants. Um, one plant or one rack of bananas per plant, that's all you get. Um, and they take a lot of water and a lot of fertilizer. They do. So there are times when bananas can get too much water here. We have really heavy rains. But yeah. Um, usually the problem is it's too dry. Yeah. So, and that's our particular area. Now, there are some things, like I said, we grow apples here okay. Mm -hmm. um, we've grown a lot of different types of squash, but man, the bugs love it. Love them. We grew spaghetti squash, and out of 100 squash, we get maybe five. Well, the first year we grew spaghetti squash, and it was so incredible. We had a great crop. Never again. It was Once, like they found you. The bugs get on that telegraph and send oh, out the yeah. notice, hey, squash at this location. Uh, we've tried all kinds of things to keep the squash around away, or the bugs away from them. And usually the chickens really love squash season. Yeah, yeah, we grow a lot of squash for chickens. So we've got spaghetti squash planted right now, and we, we plan to um, cover put, it. Cover it, yeah, we're going to cover it. And uh, we've got some uh, delicata squash growing. Mm -hmm. Our delicatas were really good the first try, but again, you know, less than 50% of them actually made it to our table. Yeah. Um, but you know, when, when you're farming, you got to grow enough for you and for the bugs, and then a little bit extra to give away. So that's just farming. And when it comes to uh, plants and flowers, um, dahlias love it here. Um, mm -hmm. What else? I think everything flower-wise, we haven't found Pretty anything much. that doesn't Lots love it. Lots of different kinds of tulips, not yeah. tulips, but um, lilies. Lilies. Yeah. Um, so bougainvillea, yeah. uh, plumbago, um, uh, hibiscus, absolutely hibiscus is everywhere here. Yeah. Um, lots of plumerias. Uh, I can't think of anything we don't have here. Yeah. This sticky thing behind us, it loves it. Keeps poking me in the back. Yeah. Um, these things is kind of a fern and it grows great here. Lots of ferns grow here. Um, yeah, I would say the, from a, a gardening perspective, the, the flowers and such. I don't have anything that I think we've tried to grow that couldn't grow. Um, if it doesn't grow, it more just doesn't like where you put it. You can move it around the property and it, it'll find a place that it likes more you end up with more tropical plants here than you would elsewhere. And like the ficus tree, we always had ficus in the States and potted plants in the house. It was a house plant. Here it's a tree. So... Uh, with an enormous root system. <laughs> enormous. Yeah. Um, vinca. So a vinca never dies. It just keeps growing and it, it will grow into like a little mini tree. That's one of the cool things here is that, you know, what's considered an annual um, back in Texas turns into a perennial here. Oh, yeah. So it's it just keeps going and going and going. And some things eventually have a life cycle and die out. But mm -hmm. most of these things just keep on growing. You plant them once and they're good. We've got status that we planted. Mm -hmm. we, we did transplants. And um, they've been in the ground a couple of years and they're still growing. Um, we have... Um, you know, just lots of things like four o'clocks uh, here that's called Marvel de Peru. Mm -hmm. They just keep coming back, coming back. They're, they're great plants. Roses tend to do pretty well here. Yeah. Um, you will get the thrips on them and aphids. Yeah. Uh, it does happen. The plumeria, the Hawaiian lathe flowers, those grow really well here. They die out a little bit during the dry season, but they come right back. So, uh, yeah. So growing on the equator, you know, there's this this is such a diverse country. There's so many different areas, so many different microclimates. We can't judge the whole country by what we're saying, but no. we can tell you here in the Vilcabamba area, it's not easy being a, a gardener and no. you know a homesteader, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, just don't believe the you know all of the hullabaloo about how great it is, because it's just like anywhere else. It's going to take some work. Yeah, and it's, there's a learning curve, which is fine. Everything has a learning curve, so. 
Yeah, and if you think there's no bugs at this elevation, I dare you to get here and get your old white legs and some shorts and walk <laughs> outside a while, see what happens to you. I mean, it's gorgeous weather here. A lot of people could wear shorts, but we don't for a reason. Yeah, Texas, I wore shorts almost every day of the year, with the exception of a few winter days. Mm. Here, I rarely wear shorts. If I wear them, it's in the house or around the just around walking around the outside here. Yeah, but. you don't want to walk near a river or any tall grass or anything like that. Yeah, so you will get eaten up. Mm. So, you know, that's our take on it. Um, there's lots of people here being very successful in this area using organic methods, but I guarantee they're putting a lot of work into their soil, um, just like we are. Sure. And uh, probably even more than we are. Uh, we don't want to work as hard at it anymore. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, don't expect to come here and it's a magical kingdom. You're just going to put seeds in the ground and it's all going to be fun and games. Oh, no. Um, that will not happen. I promise you. And things that worked for you from where you are to how it is here may not work. Yeah. just is what it is. You know, I heard a pastor say one time that God may not want to use in what he used in some other church at some other time in your church today. And it's the same thing with gardening. Um, you may want to try to come here and apply all your ideas. Uh, it's not going to work here. <laughs> no, and one of the things, we did a lot of aquaponics in the States and Texas where you needed the aquaponics because of how dry it was through the whole season to have anything you needed to go to aquaponics. And people ask us, why didn't you do aquaponics here? And it's like, we don't need to. We don't need to, and it... Aquaponics is an input intensive oh, yeah. um, way to grow. So finding all the things that you need to keep the water pH right, to keep everything right yeah. in aquaponics here is a lot more difficult and you have to ship it in. Quite mm -hmm. frankly, aquaponics is an expensive way to grow. Oh yeah. This is a country where the head of lettuce I sold for five bucks in the US sells for under a dollar here most of the time. Most of the time. Um, so, yeah, why go to a country where, you know, you get the least amount for your product mm. and pour that kind of input into it? Yeah. Doesn't make sense to me. True. So I hope you look at some Korean natural farming methods mm -hmm. and think about applying those when you come here because that's low inputs, low cost, and uh, trying to use things that are in the area. And make friends with some Ecuadorian farmers, find out what they're doing, and uh, try to make that work in your area as well. That's right. All right. Well, thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. You know what to do now. Hey, thanks for watching our video. Please like, subscribe, and share.